All right, we're ready for another edition of Sounding Off on Soccer. With me is Mark Goodman, the soccer rabbi. Mark, hope you're feeling okay there. Get through a, a podcast today. Uh, I know it, it. not everybody's been feeling 100%. Uh, we had counting on <clears throat> Jordan Smith to join us, and he wasn't feeling too good tonight. So it's just you and me. It's just a cold. I mean, I think uh, it's similar to what the river hounds are experiencing in terms of their seeming um, medical inability to get wins on the road, which uh, seems to be kind of a, a running thing. It's, it's, it's not it, it, in USL and in MLS, you can win all your home games and lose all your road games and make the playoffs, which is not something you can do in other leagues around the world. You know, there you wind up mid table or, you know, losing all your road games will put you into that category of, you know, being eligible for the drop. But, um, you know, I think the, the river hounds expect a lot from this year. And if they can't get wins on the road, they don't know how they're going to be able to accomplish it. Yeah, and that's really the theme that I'd like to go with tonight, at least to start off that way. You know, we're looking at some important games on the road. Sure, Tampa, Louisville, Las Vegas. Tampa, Louisville, very important in terms of, you know, hey, we're, we belong at the top. And what's been interesting is in recent years, Bob Lilly's teams have gone to Louisville and have gone to Tampa at different times and have pulled out wins. They've also gone to Tampa in particular and gotten – you know, they're beaten pretty good and then return to favor later in the season. So I don't know, what are your just general thoughts in terms of their form right now? Um, it, it's hard to take a, a general sense of the team. I mean, I think one of the things that I feel about this River House team is they, there's a few things lacking that I think um, we probably knew from the beginning of the season, but the team hasn't quite adjusted to. I think they're lacking speed. Um, there's just not a lot of pace on, on the team. And I think that that's having a, um, some effect of the ability to kind of test the back line when you're, when you're making attacks or, or really get into the final third without doing it in a very slow buildup kind of careful way or a long ball over the top and hook onto it kind of way. I mean, Alex Dixon is probably the exception to that rule. He's, he's a blister. Uh, He'll blister you and your sister, to quote Buster Rhymes. Um, but uh, and then another thing that I think is is a, a, an area that the team leaves me worrying about is kind of being tough in the tackle in the defensive midfield area. There aren't, you know, Danny Griffin is really good at that when he's really tasked with being a defensive midfielder, but he's kind of all over the place, and that's pretty frequently where he's assigned. So um, they're they're good at at second balls. They're good at in the air. Um, over midfield but like actually kind of stopping that that play after it gets through the center circle um, being a tough tackling you know shield to the to the center backs is something that the team is a little bit lacking right now and so I think both of those things have led to letting other teams into your final third a little bit easier um, being a bit um, one-dimensional in your attack without the ability to kind of put her on your feet and, and you know, just dribble at people um, from wide angles. Uh, just both things that, that lead me to, to worry a little bit about this team. I think that, that, that those both were issues with Tampa Bay. Um, they were both issues with Louisville, who are a really talented team. Um, they were issues against Cincinnati, although Cincinnati was – uh you know really it was a usl team playing an mls team on the road again though um and i think the other issue with that game was was just uh you know kind of depth um you know once we got into the 70th 80th 90th minute guys were guys were tired and um we had to we had to use the bench and so on and las vegas was just a mess and i i think uh with the las vegas game we should just kind of discount it and, and move on but matt um matt john what do you see that's uh that's messing with this team and keeping them from being effective on the road. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm listening to a lot of things that you're saying and I'm, I'm kind of, yeah, I, I could see, you know, in terms of the defensive, I, the surprise to me has been Riverhound teams that go on the road, especially under Bob Lilly, the last four years, they, they don't really give too much. They don't give up too much space. They tend to get into a little bit more of a defensive mode. And I, 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 from what I saw on Saturday, they, 
they were they wanted to get forward i think they wanted to be aggressive and there's sometimes bob likes to bob likes to you know try to take games to opponents and it seemed like it was nip and tuck it was a 50 50 battle but they just sort of ran out of gas and they left way too much space on the on the back end and uh, we saw them get hurt a couple times in the second half with just conceding too much space and those when you play three in the back too sometimes that's going to that's going to come up to bite you you do need as you said you need that that kind of those two defensive midfielders or one that whoever that is there to really to be able to win a lot of those battles and and, and handle toughness and dealing with some I mean we're talking high quality players Tampa Louisville have uh, in the attacking midfield and I, I don't know I think they, they've been left exposed too much in in just enough situations they're met they're they're winning the possession battle of course they're down once they fell they you know obviously picked up the, the pace in terms of the possession and, and had the edge and and were pressing forward but the other thing that ails them has been being clinical in the final third and we saw that in the two wins at home and i think that's another issue uh it's interesting that you talk about speed you know obviously that can be a difference maker albert dequa and um dane kelly obviously there's a lot of quality there and they've been having a pretty good season but now that you mention that you know cicerone is the one that's making those 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 runs that Bob's really looking for. He's starting to come more into his own the way he, he did last year in terms of being that that final uh, answer in the final third with the buildup. But the buildup, as you said, I, I think there's there's I think they might need one more guy. Maybe we see Dixon up higher. I, I don't know. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, for me, it's also about using your fullbacks uh, as those pacey guys. I mean, I thought Ryan James was a speed merchant. I mean, the dude just had afterburners and he also had a really nice handle on the ball. Um, I I can't really, you know, I feel like Dixon, um, he, he technically, according to the, the, the team sheet to the lineup, he plays at a wing back kind of position on the right side this last game. Um, but I feel like he really is kind of like mostly available in the final third. So he's not, he's not picking up the ball deep enough to kind of blow by guys at midfield. I feel like he, he tends to pick up the ball one, once you're well past the halfway point. So, so I don't know. I think you made a good point about Dequa though. Um, I just feel like Dequa plays up so high that his speed is only an asset in like a, like a 10 meter burst at the, at the very end. So, but the, the quality in the, in the final third piece, the finishing is always a concern, um, you know, with everyone, except I think Dane Kelly, who's really, really deadly um, inside the box. And uh, you know, I think a little bit of squad rotation plus his red card uh, has meant that we haven't seen, um, as much of him and also you know I mean he's a he's an older dude like you don't you can't roll him out every game and, and go in 90 minutes with him um, because you want him fresh as a daisy for the end of the season so that the river hounds can have him you know at peak form right when we hit the playoffs which is which is an ideal thing and I think looking at Bob Lilly teams in the past um, and you can you can disagree with me on this John and I would be cool with that I feel like they wilt a little bit at the end of the season. And I feel like that has to do possibly with how much, how many minutes guys play throughout the season that um, Bob isn't, isn't always uh, great at Bob Lilly. Our head coach isn't always great at resting guys. Um, I think he's a little bit, uh, he wants to build stamina for players. And then um, I feel like they, they look a little tapped at the end of the season. That is an arguable point though. Well, I wouldn't say I, I, the way I would, look at it as bob headed heading into this season it was all about the depth right it was all about well we've got 18 players 20 guys we can go deep we're going to have a lot of squad rotation this year and then as the season goes on i wonder to 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 your to your point i wonder how much of bob loses guys start to get in the outhouse and guys start to get you know not in a rotation like we, we've barely seen robbie Dambrot in the last, you know, five to seven games. We, you know, we see guys kind of fall out of favor, kind of come and go and not be as steady of a, 
you know, a squad rotation. And I'm wondering that, you know, that is that an issue? Do are there is there some fatigue in terms of certain players that just kind of fall out of favor and, and who knows why and what? But um, I'm sure the, the, the team uh, chemistry and cohesiveness, though, I, I think at least I sense I've been to a few you know, training sessions in the past month or so. And I sense a, a pretty, a lot of a pretty good chemistry with this group. Uh, again, it's easy for me to say that I've only seen them train maybe three or four times. Uh, we kind of get a little bit of a feel for their locker room and for, you know, what they're like around each other here and there at some home games, um, maybe even after the games when we see them all hanging out and stuff like that. But I think that is important. And I think that is something that this team, you know, with leadership and because they're, they're on the threshold, but they need to get to that next level. And are they really, where are they? Where are they in terms of that cohesion and guys willing to play a lesser role to win a title or win, be part of something special. I'm wondering about that. I'm wondering about, you know, Dequa or, even Dan Kelly, like you said, knowing his age, maybe is different. He's not going to be rolled out from the starting lineup every time. Um, Louis Argudo, somebody like that, who knows, you know, right. hey, I've got a chance to continue my career, play at a high level. You know, I'm not an MLS, but I'm also not starting every match. And so how am I going to contribute to this group? Am I, is he, a, uh, I have a lot of questions about that. I, I'm not saying that they, they have any bad chemistry or anything. I'm just saying, how's all of this going to fit and and what what really i wonder too what everyone's roles are going to be as the season progresses or we've seen that bob lilly teams over the years any team that goes through a 32 game season that roles the guys evolve into different roles through the course of the season so um what i wonder also jordan questioned the team's defensive um defense towards the end of the last match um, I just felt like they were they were so stretched that it really wasn't on the back three, um, at least from what I could see in that match. Yeah, the the back line is a really interesting bunch. I think uh, Jelani Peters and Mikael Williams are kind of flip and flopping for each other every match, whether we start one or the whether they start one or the other. Um, Arturo Odonez, interestingly enough, seems to be the kind of like, you know, in ink or chiseled in stone guy on the team sheet every week, considering he's a rookie in USL coming from Pitt, um, but an older rookie being that he he left, I think, Pitt as a either a graduate student or as a senior who is a little older. So um, but, you know, uh, and, and Shane Wheat can can kind of come in and play as more of a fullback um, or as one of the center backs. So. Um, I've been really, you know, pleased with the way the defense functions, but I definitely think you have a good point that like, there's something missing there. They're a little bit long on um, big guys who clear the ball really well, a little short on uh, flat out speed in the open field. Um, and I think a little bit with, with when Mikel Williams isn't on the field, I get nervous about passing out of the back. I feel like the passing out of the back is just a little bit choppy. I feel like Mikel's the only guy who's like cool under fire. Everybody else just looks a little bit nervous. So I think those are some of my issues along the back line. I think one of the other interesting issues along the back line is the switch at um, keeper. I mean, at the beginning of the season, it was Kevin Silva and Chase Vosvik as your starting two rotation that Bob was using. Um, I think Lily often goes with two keepers uh, with a few exceptions in the time that I've been here. Um, and then Jamali White came in and had a killer game in the U.S. Open Cup. And now it looks like the rotation is Silva and Waite. Um, uh, and that's really interesting for me to see. Um, I think they're both great keepers, but uh, trying to figure out, like, what does that mean, you know, and only one of them is going to start our first playoff match, you know, knock on wood that we get to the playoffs. Right. And that Bob made it clear after the second one, nothing win, when he was asked, well, actually after both of the one, nothing wins that, that, that even silver winning, uh, being on the USL team of the week, uh, the miraculous save, uh, or he made a nice, a nice PK save at the end of the match that kind of kept that match or else that could have been a, a draw. 
uh, against uh, El Paso. He just, Bob said, this, this spot's it's still up for grabs. And he, I think he likes the competition. I think it's still, we're in this first, we're still in the first half of the season, probably a, a past a quarter point of the season, but, but somewhere in that second quarter of the season now, uh, I believe what, 10 games in or 11 games in, I, I think he's at least waiting until they get past the halfway point in the season. If they still don't have a, a, a consistent starter, or at least a guy that they, they really believe in, and it's like you said, to get into that playoff, those playoff game type situations, um, it'll, it may be concerning, but I, I think it's a little too early. It's a little early to be concerned, but at the same time, this is, this is what happens when you rotate or you just decide every, every year or every other year to go with a, a whole new crop of keepers. You, sometimes you, you need a, a lot more of the season to see who's going to be the guy. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. As far as this team in terms of, you know, you mentioned the defenders and Nathan Dos Santos, uh, and he also earned uh, you know, team of the week honors the previous week. Uh, he's been a decent playmaker up the left side uh, or uh -huh. either, either wing. I think he's another guy like Ordonez, you know, first year right out of college. He won a national championship at, at Marshall. And he's sort of, as I mentioned, Bobby <coughs> Dambrot hasn't been playing a whole lot. It's, it's been Dos Santos has sort of seized that, that spot there. Um, maybe not quite a Ryan James, but I think he's, he's been, he's shown signs that he could be an excellent player at this level. Yeah. I, I, uh, when I was working the game, uh, the home game two weeks ago, I was uh, definitely, I was on the coach's side uh, for the second half when um, players went in and Robbie Dambrot went in and Bob was just chewing his ear off from the beginning of his stepping onto the pitch till the end. He was just, you know, Robbie, you're too high. Robbie, you need to get there. Robbie, you know, where are you? Robbie, why aren't you filling in that spot? And he was really giving it to him. So you were mentioning that a guy was in the outhouse. Uh, I believe the expression is actually the doghouse, but doghouse outhouse, Robbie Tambrot is in it. Um, he just hasn't established himself as a player who knows what the coach wants and fills in the spot in the right place. I will say that um, on the first goal that Jake LaCava scored, I think Nathan Dos Santos was probably responsible, although he basically fielded the ball off his chest and then he kind of like didn't field it cleanly and then he fell down and LaCava put it in the back of the net. Whether that was like, you know, his fault, quote unquote, or whether it was really, you know, a failure on the other side to close down the high looping cross that came in is another question. But um I'm with you. I think Nathan Dos Santos has been a very good player. Um, one of the challenges in USL, of course, is if they were exceptional players who were flawless, who did every piece of the game really well, they'd be in MLS, right? Like one of the things that's interesting about USL is guys are always kind of missing one or two or three things. Like there's, there's a couple of things they're really good at a couple of things. They, they tend to be average or so, so at, and um, for, for Dos Santos, it, it might be kind of like being, clinical and clean um on that first touch on a play like that where you kind of settle that ball and clear it um or you have real awareness of, of situational awareness of what you need to do at any given moment um that that could be a thing that uh all the all the hounds need to work on in order to get this team to start performing better on the road or it could be small sample size i mean they had a couple wins on the road to start the season um over Memphis and uh, I forget who the other one was. That um, road against uh, the road win against Memphis looks even better now. Yeah, but I, it's interesting. And now we're looking at the USL. I mean, it's way too early to really get into worrying too much about where the the Hounds were for any team up in the top part of the standings. To worry too much about positioning. You kind of have to stay the course. Uh, it, obviously Pittsburgh playing another road game. They've, I think they've played a lot of, I'm trying to think definitely more road games. I think the, of their 11 league matches, I think it's either six or seven have been on the road. So, and then another one coming in Miami. So they're going to have some more games, uh, home games coming up in bunches uh, through the summer. 
as the weather gets warmer and hopefully more fans start to fill in at Highmark Stadium. Uh, but you mentioned something I wanted to touch on too about Bob players really buying in and doing what he wants. And that's really half the battle sometimes and why maybe you see a potentially talented player, a player who's played pretty well at this level, veterans even. We've seen veterans come in and not really fit in um, sometimes. And, you know, Bob does, he does take, sometimes take some chances in terms of personnel and bringing guys in. I know he, he likes to bring players in who really fit his system uh, and do what he wants to do. But I, I do think that is something that, again, why we see players maybe drop off during the course of a season uh, and maybe not get as much playing time, that sort of thing. Um, is there anybody else out there, uh, you know, on the roster that you just feel like you haven't seen enough of yet? I mean, I know the Luke Biasi and Mark Ibarra, have, you know, they've, they've kind of seen some time here and there. They've, they've, they've had some decent moments. And then there's, you know, other, a few other players out there we haven't seen a whole lot of. Well, I talked to William Yang uh, last week. He was not dressed for the match. Mm -hmm. um, he's apparently been dealing with a hamstring issue. Really nice guy. I really enjoyed talking to him. Um, so clearly he, I don't think he has a single minute this year. Um, Luis Argudo has been kind of a squad player. He's been rotated in and out. And he's been really, really exceptional in the matches that he's been in. Um, and other than that, I think, uh, we're all kind of waiting to see kind of youngster Jesse Williams get a little bit more time. He's only played in one match for this team too. Um, kind of one of those, uh, the triumvirate on the team of, of Trinidad and Tobago players. But, um, you know, I think, uh, Yang would be the one I'm most looking forward to, but it, you know, he is stacked deep at forward, although Cicerone you know, sometimes plays it forward, sometimes plays at midfield, although he's listed as a forward. Um, Argudo has the same kind of ability that he can be your number 10 or he can he can play to lead the line. But um, so, you know, for me, it's like if Yang was good enough to get onto the field, where would you even play him if you wanted to? Um, you know, and I think one of the challenges that that Bob Lilly, yeah, that Bob Lilly has is just trying to figure out what what the what the formation should be when you have a lot of talented guys like they do. Well, I think Yang, um, I Yang, I, I believe is the correct Thank pronunciation. You. Uh, Mac Rubber corrected me, believe me. Um, I believe he's kind of that third wheel in terms of the, the Kelly Dequa rotation target forward, kind of a big body who can, you know, hold the ball up. I'm, I don't, I haven't really seen him kind of getting forward and breakaway speech on it. I've seen him play. Uh, he has, I think he's played, uh, he played in the open cup match. Maybe one came off the bench or one other match. I think that's about it, but yeah, the other name, and you mentioned something earlier that was very interesting. You mentioned that, that defensive midfielders being able to kind of just kind of be that uh, solid one-on-one -on -one defender and Angelo Kelly Rosales, who played a lot of minutes for Charleston last year and has right. played a lot of minutes in the USL uh, has been really a, a, a late game sub off the bench in just about all of his appearances this year. Just that he's, he fits that mold. I mean, of all the players, if you looked at up and down the roster, 20 plus player uh, field players, Angelo yeah, yeah. Kelly Rosales is the guy that could come in and be that, you know, if you just wanted the only player in the Bob Lilly reign that really did that, did that. And we've talked about this before and, preseason i think when we talked about during the preseason uh show like the danny earls type player somebody who's just gonna just you know make those tackles yep. and and just be a stopper and and that's the really the he's the one guy there i think that that can do that it's kind of like <laughs> Mo Dabo, uh, it was the only one that bob Lilly yeah. had before that that did that was really like that yeah, and if you look at that third goal that uh, Lucky M. Kasana scored against us in this match, which was a, a fluky little, you know, you know, high ball from the keeper that bounced through, but then um, Canardo Forbes, who is usually a, a fine defender but not an exceptional defender, he really did. He really made a meal of that. He really made a mess of of that situation. You would think that a guy like Kelly Rosales would not allow a moment like that. And I had to look it up to see when the last time he started. And I was like, oh, he got 90 minutes. 
uh back in october when he was still playing for charleston yep. um so he hasn't started a single match which is interesting that uh, lily has just decided that that kind of like shield over the 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 back line is not a thing that he likes playing anymore he just he he wants to have you know we well, joke about we joke about lily ball lily ball right. being uh grinded out one to nothing with a lot of defense and he doesn't really play that anymore. He's really mm. trying to put forward a lot of offensive players. There's at least seven guys who are ready to get up the field. And, you know, he's not, he's not really using a pure defensive midfielder anymore. And that was clearly the case in the three to one loss to Tampa the other day. It was clearly the case. They were, they were, I mean, they were just stretched out. Yeah. They were trying to play that way. And I don't know, it was just leaving what you have three players. You have Danny Griffin, uh, maybe Danny Rivera, Canardo Forbes, um, really, I mean, all terrific players and they really work well together in the central midfield when things are clicking and going well. But when, when, I mean, do you, do you trust any one of those to, to make a stop if there's, you know, one dangerous attacking midfielder coming their way um, in a, in a one-on-one -on -one situation in an open field situation? Yeah, I mean, I, I like Danny Rivera in that role, but I saw him doing it at the beginning of the year, but he hasn't started most of the games this year. You know, it's been a it's been a mostly offensive rotation of midfielders. So, you know, that's how Bob wants to play. You know, we'll 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 see how it, it, it comes together. Uh, it's it's entertaining. There's no doubt about that. You know, there's a lot of it. There's a lot of action on the field this this year. And um, it's it's led to some high scoring games, which uh, you can't really mind, except that you. Uh, you know, at somewhere down the line, you want to, you want to make sure that you can, I mean, I think the, the question for the river hounds is of course, kind of like, where do we finish in the table? Um, and do we finish in a position to have a home playoff game? I think that's probably, we're getting ahead of ourselves, John, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but we really should. That's really what hounds fans are thinking about. We assume we're going to make the playoffs, which is a great, great place to be. Um, but we assume that the river hounds, uh, we don't assume that the Riverhounds are going to give their fans a home playoff game. And that's so, so important because it's been a couple of years now. It certainly has. So I think the fans really want to see it badly. We've talked about it a lot. We talked about it last year. We talked about it in the off season. That is definitely a goal for this, for this franchise, for this club. Um, so long way to go. I think they're in okay position, but they've really got to, as you talked about in your preview ahead of the Tampa match, they they probably have underachieved to this point this season. A little bit. I mean, I think um, it's a really talented team um, trying to figure out where the holes are. We both have opinions about the little holes, but you look at the raw talent. When you, if you go back into, uh, for those of our hardcore fans for sounding off on soccer, want to go back in the sounding off on soccer archives and hear about our preseason talk. We just thought this team was loaded with loaded for bear with talent. And now it's kind of figuring out like, well, if they got so many good guys, how come they're not getting better results? And I feel like we're, we're at that point where we can ask that question legitimately. And within the next six to eight games is when we go from saying like, how come in the, how come they got so many good guys and they're not getting results. And then six to eight games from now, we can start to say like, maybe they don't have so many good guys. Maybe, Maybe they've got a lot of guys who used to be good and uh, the expiration date in the USL has, uh, has turned from milk to yogurt, you know? That is certain possibility, especially in a 32 game season, three very important players over the age of 30. So that's definitely an issue. So they're heading to Miami next. Um, start queuing the uh, Miami um, uh, preparations. Uh, Mark, I know you'll probably provide a, another outstanding uh, scouting report. We always look forward to those. Um, before you do that, just any initial thoughts on what we might want, might expect from Miami. I know all four games last year were, were pretty hard fought and they were really a thorn in the hound side last year. I mean, the, they're always a fun team. Their ownership really cares about getting it right. And I think that that's, that usually leads to some really interesting players on the, um, on the team sheet. Um, you know, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't make a Paco Craig, um, Karma Chameleon. Uh, his father was the bassist for um, uh, whatchamacallit for Boy George reference. 
So, um, you know, Paco Craig, he's back with Miami FC. You come, you go, you come and you go. Um, and Devin Speedy Williams is with this team too. And he's just absolute chaos and so much trouble. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a very, um, kind of experienced usl roster full of like names that we know and guys that are tough to play against and um it should be a a really fun game um you know miami tends to be physical uh a little bit and tends to be fast um i look at this roster and it looks less fast than it used to be uh adonijah reed is 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 a burner though and so is bolo bolo akinyote so um it could be really i mean this 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 roster is just long on Jamaicans, so that's so that's also something interesting that I just noticed right now. Um, so it should be a lot of fun. And um, John, the Hounds have been down there the whole time. Did they stay in in Florida for a week? They didn't come back. Is that right? No, they came back. As far as oh I wow, know. Bob even said that. So yeah, I um, they 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 came back. It was interesting. I maybe a west coast trip they stay but i guess uh frequent yeah. flyer miles are, are okay in the uh in with toughy bucks i guess <laughs> cheap cheaper than a hotel stay if you fly on like ryanair or something like that absolutely yeah it's true all right well mark thank you for uh joining us on this latest uh, edition of sounding off on soccer um we are excited that not only will this edition be available on pittsburgh sports live but we are going to be uh also you can hear this on different uh, well if you're listening now you're obviously hearing it on the different formats but we are excited that we have been added to some different podcast formats on spotify and apple and, and some other platforms so uh, we are excited about that uh mark again thank you for joining me and i uh, hope you do feel uh even better tomorrow yeah if not sudafed is my friend all right. Well, cheers to that and have a good night's sleep. Uh, I'm sure the Sudafed will help. <laughs>